Hi, my name is Jim Margraff. I'm CEO and founder of iFluence. And uh, in the late 90s, a neurologist sat with a patient who was, uh, quadri had quadriplegia and was locked in, and he couldn't speak. Um, the man developed a device to put on the man's, uh, this uh, fellow's head, uh, Dr. Torch developed this, so that uh, the quadriplegic could communicate by blinking with Morse code. That evolved over the next 15 plus years with about $15 million of financing from the Department of Defense through a series of, of wearable eye tracking devices. So iFluence I founded a few years ago, building upon that team's work and extending that to see how far we could take eye interaction. Um, along the way, as Dr. Torch was working on his developments, um, I was developing and starting companies and happened to start one as well. And the things I'll focus on are you're using your head, your eyes, your mouth, and your hands. So it happened, I created a company to make an interactive sphere with a base, with a processor, and a stylus that you could interact with, a physical device that was a talking globe. But it was fascinating to see how people interact with this physical device. I would, I would say that any adult in this room or child that I saw, when you approach a sphere, a globe, you'll do the same thing. It's completely predictable. You'll use your hands first to grab it and spin it. You'll move it around until your eyes focus on your home city, your home state. You'll look at that, and then you'll exclaim, that's where I live. Everyone does it. So I looked at that, and, and at the time my son was four, and he was interacting a different way. He was looking, learning how to read. So I took this idea, I flattened it out, put some paper on it, and I created another tool. So I started this company, and we took Explore, and we developed a tool to teach kids to read. And again, it was about watching his eyes, watching the eyes of users as they took now a kinesthetic tool with a, with a uh, static art and audio feedback, and how did they engage? with their head, their hands, their eyes, and eventually their voice, because we added a stylus to the microphone to this. You could speak, record your voice, assign it to paper, as well as a stylus right on the paper. We created something we called the seven second rule, which was empirical after watching people interact with static art upon realizing that if their eyes remained fixed on a point for about seven seconds due to the lack of audio interaction that drove them away from that point, they'd lose interest, they'd walk away. So we had to create rules to guide their eyes away. And we were very sensitive to eye holding. That evolved into a, another company that I started called Livescribe, and I made a smart pen. So here, now we had a tool that would allow you to capture information as you're writing and optionally record information as you're writing, even speak as you're writing to draw out a description of something and augment it with your voice in real time and produce an interactive movie. So all these were about how we interact with different media. So um, we can look now at this next media, which is, we all know, it's an incredible number of companies creating different forms of, of positioning information in front of our eyes with different display types. So how do we interact with this? Well, we can look at a couple things. First of all, let's look at your hands. So when we look at hand usage, which is, I don't know if that's playing, but that's a little snippet from Magic Leap. We know as well what one can do with their hands and interact. And start, I start by looking at what I've learned about these different companies and tools, but also look at this now and say, how long does it take? Speed is very important. And where's your focus? Where are your eyes when you're using something and controlling something with your hands? And how do these come together? Where's your head? And what are you doing with your voice? So then we can look at this and say, how about now your head? We've got IMUs in the devices. I can move my head around at the same time. But think about what happens when you put these all together. And of course, I can look at my voice and speaking. Well, we speak about two words per second. Did a lot of measurements on speaking for the leap pad. And so we know how fast we speak. It's a great tool for certain types of control, but you're not going to say move the cursor up to the left until you get, it's not going to happen. So we have to look at what we do now to interact, but we also need to think about the medium differently. It's not the same medium. We don't want shovelware taking old content, putting it onto this new medium, and just creating the same thing and saying, wow, I've got a movie that's 3D at 360, or I'm creating a game with different forms of input. We need to think differently. That's where the eyes come in. So what can you do with your eyes? What really can one do with your eyes? Well, we know what you can't do or what you shouldn't do. <laughs> and lots of parity on glass. And our premise basically is that HMDs, any HMD is fundamentally incomplete without using your eyes. But what does that mean? So we can start with what I'll call the simple, valuable, but mundane. Things like panning, zooming, clicking, scanning, scrolling, interacting, playing games that one could do with their eyes. Well, can one do that with their eyes? When I talk to most people, they think, I can't control my eyes. They go every direction. How do I actually use my eyes to control and interact? Well, we looked at this and said, we want to be able to transform intent, your intent, into action using your eyes. What does that mean? Well, it starts with intent, and it starts with the eyes. So let's take a look at the eye. When we look at it, 
we see how light enters the eye. This is what we've done. We've looked at how light enters the eye, comes through the lens, comes through the cornea first, hits the lens, propagates to the back of your eye, to your retina, your foveal area. You've got to look at density of rods and cones and consider what you can see, where you're looking. Of course, foveated rendering is a big piece of that. But go further. Now let's look at the eye-brain connection, which is a critical because this gets overlooked. So we now have to look at intent which is synaptic activity in your mind. We have to look at how that combines with light that's flowing through your eyes to your occipital region. We have to look at the timing of this information. Then we have to figure out what do we do with this? Is there some way to extract some information around your eye movements that gives, that is your intent, but that's controllable? It's not out of control. It has to be something completely predictable that you can repeat that's not just statistically right. So, what we've done is we've developed technology that lets one do that. So imagine that you could take a smartphone, and anything you could do with your finger on a smartphone, you could do with one or both eyes, but faster. <coughs> anything you could do with a tablet or a smartphone, with your fingers, you could do with one or both eyes, but faster and under control. So we've developed technology to do that. And the way we've, we position this is understanding, first of all, the philosophy of how you then the underlying technology and what we call our 12 laws, Ifluence 12 laws. The first law is let your eyes do what your eyes do. It sounds pretty simple, but if you don't do that, you end up forcing people to do very strange things with their eyes. And we've seen what that looks like when somebody looks like they have a spasm or otherwise. You can't do it. Also, it fatigues your eyes. That doesn't work. So you have to have a way somehow to be able to let your eyes do what your eyes do. And you look at categories. I've only put a few really simple labels up here, context, focus, distraction. But this continues on down, and it's all based upon looking at this eye-brain connection. So what does it mean? First of all, speed. Your eyes are one of the fastest moving, if not fastest moving, part of your body. They'll move up to 900 degrees per second when your eyes move. That's fast. And you look at that in millisecond activity, and you think about thought and intent, and you look at your eyes moving, it creates some real sparks, amazing things you can do. You look at forms of communication. Well, our eyes, we use our eyes subconsciously and consciously to communicate continuously. That can be explicit communication applied to, to, to deal with specific information, or it can be subtle, dealing with interchange with characters. And we are seeing this evolve as we look now at how eye tracking and eye interaction can be deployed in different types of headsets and virtual reality with characters. Then we can look at learning which I've studied a great deal, and I'm fascinated by the implications of where one's eyes are in the process of absorbing information and what can be extracted, as well as the type of control that can be applied as you use your eyes consciously to interact and control information that's presented to you. And uh, then, of course, uh, support for disability. This is a friend of ours, Eric, who's a pal. He cannot move. He's, he's prolific in his communication online, and he's now had ALS for uh, near nine years. And, uh, he, we work with him a great deal, as well as others in the ALS community, Steve Gleason, a football player, and a team of folks, for whom we, we, what we'd like to do is allow them to communicate as rapidly as I can speak, solely with their eyes. And we're a far cry from that today. Typically, they can type by dwelling maybe 10 words, maybe 15. One or two people can get to 20 words a second. We speak at 120 words a second plus. So that's a neat, really, really fascinating goal. And finally, what does it mean for cognition? Let's go back to the fact that our eyes move in tens of millisecond rate. Well, there should be an opportunity to harness that and somehow link that back to my intent and my thinking and the rate at which I can look and absorb information to quantify or to, to take that information in developmental models and approach what I can do with my short-term and working memory and create something that no one has done before. So we're very excited because we've created now tools. We'd be happy to meet. Uh, there's some people we've already talked meeting about and shown this uh, under NDA at this point. But uh, there's some powerful technology which will evolve the fundamental modes that we use for communicating in AR and VR. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. So no demo? I can't do a demo today, unfortunately. Right. Thank Just you. But, but um, yeah, we're, we're meeting with, uh, with potential partners to do demos. <coughs> yep. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. A hardware or software solution? Uh, the question was, is it a hardware or software solution? It's both. It can't be done purely with software and can't be done purely with hard. You have to, this is a system solution to address the type of the approach that we take. 
it's more than he's, it's, the question was it's more than just a camera facing the eye. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes. Uh, right. So, I mean, it's, it sounds very exciting. There's all sorts of interesting things that you see people do with eyes, in particular for context. I was interested in when you were talking about using it for selection or things that are very intentional. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you're using uh, dwell time to, for instance, get rid of the Midas touch problem. Mm -hmm. right, seven seconds seems like a long time. Oh, re the reference to seven seconds was back at LeapFrog that I observed people's eyes. Um, we have the Midas, we've conquered the Midas touch problem. Oh, great. I can't it's, wait to see. It's resolved. Yeah. yeah, what that means is the classic reference in literature refers to King Midas uh, endowed with a gift such that everything he would touch would turn to gold. So the idea, it, re it relates to eye tracking traditionally and thinking about your eyes and imagine that you have the opportunity to select icons on a page and a menu and imagine that everything you look at activates upon looking at it. So the way that's typically solved is different means with an affordance that allows you to click perhaps once you've looked at it or dwell. So typically what's used is dwell or affordance or winking, which are all um, quite limited. So one d shouldn't need to use any of those affordances. Yep. Sir, I had a, a quick question for yes. you. Given how quickly the eye moves, and you've referenced that uh, numerous times here, enhancing predictive and intuitive programs, are you in looking at uh, ocular muscle micro expressions to help enhance that production? Yeah, so the question was, well, you can, it's, it relates to, uh, to the biomechanics of the eye. One needs to, to, to do what we've done. You need to look at, at the combination of the eye-brain connection, which involves all aspects of thought, timing, and all motion. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, is eye strain a concern with a technology such as this, and what are the thresholds that you've established for that? Great question, and I'll point back to the, which is why I put up our 12 laws, and the first law is paramount. Let your eyes do what your eyes do. If you're, all of us are moving our eyes, many, we could look at the numbers of, of, of activity of saccades and other type of motion that occur. We can look at that, um, and it's continuous for us. And what we do is nothing that you don't normally do with your eyes already. The moment we force you outside of that, then it fatigues, and there's a problem. But as long as we abide by that rule, let your eyes do what your eyes do, there's no fatigue. And you can achieve the type of things we've been speaking about. Yes? How far along is the product development? Um, so uh, founded again, the, the technology has been in development, the fundamentals, since the late 90s, government financing. And uh, the new co that I founded, iFluence, is, uh, I founded it at the end of, at the beginning of 2013. So we've evolved it from that over the last now two and a half years. And at this point, what I've described, everything I've described is, is working. Right, so the question is, we're meeting with companies, yeah, we're meeting with a broad range of companies, correct, for, for partnerships. I think that's about all the time we have for questions okay. for Jim, but thank you very much, Jim. Thank you.